Hello to all our dear friends. We welcome you to our Sunday morning roundtable discussion with the subject of probation after death. We are recording from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent, Plainfield, New Jersey, in the United States of America. We welcome you all. And we will start with our morning prayer. I'm reading from page 195 of Divinity Course in General Collectania, and also page 282. Probation progress goes on until there is no life, substance, or intelligence in matter. No person, no thing in all the universe, no claim of circumstances, can by any possibility interfere between me and all joy and all good. God is all. There is no evil. All is harmony. There is no discord. All is health. There is no sickness. All is spirit. There is no matter. All is joy. There is no sorrow. All is truth. There is no falsehood. All is faith, there is no fear. All is life, there is no death. All is love, there is no hate. Thank you very much. All right, our watching point. Watch number 418. Watch that you differentiate between robbery in the physical and in the mental realm. In the physical realm, one can be robbed of that which he values, but not so in the mental realm. There, one can never be robbed of any good whatsoever. He cannot be robbed of God, of his ability to reflect God, or of his true sense of life and love. Robbery in the mental realm is the acceptance of the suggestion that one has been robbed. The proper protection or correction is to reject the suggestion, not, a, not to change a fact. In science, a fact can never change, but we lose sight of it through suggestion. Death is merely the suggestion that one can be robbed of everything. So each lesser claim of robbery that is resisted is that much toward overcoming the last enemy. Whereas if one admits robbery in the smallest degree, he has left open the door through which death may finally come. This explains why when Mrs. Eddy was not served a piece of cheese to which she was entitled, she is reported to have said, if they can rob me of my cheese, they can rob me of my life. Thank you. <clears throat> Comments on that? <laughs> well, I can, the, the, that statement that um, let no man take your joy away from you, I can see that that's a bit much bigger. <laughs> It, uh, we cannot be allowed to be, have our joy robbed or anything. And I think, wow, what's that? I can see the import, more of the importance of that because if we can let our joy be taken away from us, then it can go on with other things. We can allow anything to be taken, any good, seemingly, to be robbed from us in our uh, and That's uh, he cannot be. We, but to know we cannot be robbed of God. Or our, or our ability to reflect him, or of our true sense of life and love is the antidote to that. And I, very, very good watch. I really appreciated it. Oh. Yeah, it is. Thank you. That was a wonderful watch. And it reminds me of Reverend Kratzer's article um, in Dominion Within, I believe, where he points out that um, if you were to lose your purse full of money, it has no connection to 
to your joy or peace. And to realize that is, wow, that can take you a long way. Yeah, that's a wonderful article. Thank you. I was thinking, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Who was that? uh, That's Lenny. Hi, Lenny. Go ahead. Um, At the end there, when I was thinking about what it says about the cheese, I also thought about what happened with Jesus. I think it was literally like the day before the crucifixion. And it's that story of the fig tree that didn't have any figs. And he was hungry. And for the longest time, I had never understood that story because I thought, well, you know, trees do seem to have a season. But then it occurred to me, well, this is the, this is literally on the eve of the resurrection. And he was hungered, and it was the claim that his need wasn't met. And he rebuked that claim so thoroughly that that fig tree died up. And I thought that kind of, uh, it made sense. It goes along with what Mrs. Eddy says about the cheese or that just is, you know, allowing even the smallest claim to come in. And that's what error was trying to do to Jesus. It was trying to dig in in a small way right before the largest demonstration of his career. Thank you. Yeah, this watching point, the way it explains that about the cheese, it just makes me think, like, you know, Carpenter's metaphysics were so good. And thank God he took the time to write this stuff. I, you know, nobody else really explained it as well as he does. It is very true. Yeah, I like this watching point very much, too. Um, And and this is how so many people have overcome adversity, knowing this, right? Maybe you can take everything away from a person physically, but this, you cannot be robbed of your ability to reflect God or your true sense of life and love. If, as we talked about, you know who you are in the image of God. And it's always a suggestion. It comes as a suggestion. Um, Mrs. Evans used to always talk to me about backing down. She would call it backing down um, at over suggestions. You know, first it tells you you can't do something. And then you can't do something else. And then you can't do something else. And then pretty soon you're sick and then you don't feel like doing something else. And then you see it, it it keeps getting bigger and bigger unless you stamp your foot and say no, no. Um, I think I'm, there's an even. Um, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Mary. I thought you were finished. No, go ahead. Uh, it's, it seems like there's even a larger idea here, too, this whole idea that, you know, all things work together for good to them that love God. Because Carpenter says, you know, you can be robbed in the physical realm, you know, and I think the old kind of way of the culture of the mainstream would be, hey, I'm a scientist. Why did I even get robbed? You know, I'm totally missing the mark because we have the beautiful story of Joseph was literally robbed of everything he ever had. And yet, look at the um, the blessings and look at all the wonderful demonstrations of spirit while the children were in captivity. So it's not that we're not going to have... And, and, what did Jesus, and what did Jesus say about if a man take your coat... <laughs> right. Give him your, your tunic or give him your shirt, too, whatever it was. Yeah. In other words, if someone needs or thinks that they need, you can't you can't um, you can't be punished or you can't suffer. You can't lose your joy or anything important by giving material things to people who seem to need them. At the same time. You- you shouldn't accept the thought that people are dishonest or that they need what you have, that they are not complete in God. It's, it, when you're a working scientist, uh, mm-hmm. be robbed. It's not, you know, something you should of accept. Right, okay. right, right, right. That's accepting, accepting right. the error right. first. Mm-hmm. You have to always be on guard. You have to always know that all children of God have everything they need and no one can have what you want. 
that way you're blessing them as well as yourself. So the story of Joseph, yeah, there are some stories that are, uh, yeah, that, that was leading to a great good. And if you are a working scientist and something untoward happens, you can know it will lead to a great good and claim and demand the blessings. But that doesn't, I want to make sure that's clear that you don't just accept being robbed as something that's okay. It's, it's yeah. not. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. I, I didn't mean to leave it in that, that sense. I want to read to you. This is this is a story of Mrs. Eddie and the pie and the cheese. It was something we were taught many, many times, and it was through Carpenter. Um, once Mrs. Eddie and a student had a luncheon in a Lynn cafe, and the menu read a cut of pie and cheese, 10 cents. When it came, there was no cheese. Mrs. Eddie asked the waiter for her cheese and was told they were out of it. She asked that the proprietor be sent to her and asked him, where is my cheese? He also said that they were out of it. And she said, are there not stores nearby where you can get it and thus carry out your, your word? So after a little talk, seeing she was determined, he sent out and got some cheese. To her student who was listening with astonishment, she explained, I care but little to have the cheese. But if I don't correct error in stealing little things, it will steal bigger things. And she gave the student a lesson. There's another version reporting that Mrs. Eddy said, if I let it take my cheese, it will take my life next, showing the importance of stopping error in the small things. <laughs> now, we learn here about the creeping things of age. You know, you let one thing go. You're not seeing so well. Oh, you're not doing this so well. Oh, you're not... Pretty soon it comes in with the whole kit and caboodle. This is where the moral courage is needed to stand up and say no and to get into your science and not allow these things to happen. Now, this is an important story about Mrs. Eddy. It has been misinterpreted and people say, oh, she's just an old crank. She wasn't an old crank. She knew exactly what she was doing and she had to do it and she had a right to do it, didn't she? Um, yes, she did. Yes, she did. And she blessed the restaurant proprietor in doing so, in, in, in forcing him to live up to his word. And that was principle in action, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. yes and I think the student, too. He blessed the student also with that lesson. Yes. Yeah, it was principled love. You know, places go downhill when people do not speak up. Um, you, you see it in, in, a, in a general standard of things. I mean, we definitely saw this with Mrs. Evans. She would not tolerate things that weren't right. If you sent your clothes to the cleaner, if they came back still stained, they went back. Um, you did not accept things that were not right. It was just the way you lived. And it's, it's good to be this way. It is a high standard to hold for yourself. Not to back down, or pretty soon you'll end up not knowing which end is up. Um, you know, however it comes, it can be a, a boss. I was telling Gary, I heard this interesting story. It was about a woman. She'd been uh, captured by Comanche Indians this was in the 1800s. And anyway, she was not too easy. And she was uh, a slave for an old squaw. And Finally, she got so tired of it that she she started she spoke up to the old squaw. She was yelling at her and, and carrying on, and she was worried about doing that because she thought if she did that, then there might be great repercussions. But the Indians that observed her applauded. They said, "Yay, good for you!" They gave her a new name, and she was treated with great respect until she finally found her freedom. <laughs> but sometimes you tolerate things you shouldn't, so learn to speak up. And I thought that was a great example of it. Um, in one of the articles that um, Carrie sent me, which I really loved, it was from a Honorable Clarence Bursick. And it's about Jesus in the lesson. And, it, and he writes, the words and works of Jesus, the account of which we have inherited through the New Testament, unite in showing us that he invariably refused to cons consent to error of every kind. <laughs> That he was, as Mrs. Eddy declares, the most scientific man that ever trod the globe. And he feared neither sin, sickness, or death. Why? 
because he recognized the nothingness in God's universe and so refused to consent to their claim of power over man. Never once did he consent to them. And it and then it goes and talks about the widow of Nain. Um, and he refused to consent to death, didn't he? Mm. I love that. Refused to consent, okay? Get that in your tablet of your being. It's like the hell you say. Refuse to consent. Mm -hmm. Just because don't let air boss you around any way, shape, or form. And I, I that was a great point. That's how he overcame all these things. He didn't just say, oh, well, death is inevitable. We all have to bow down to it. He refused to consent. Ask yourself, what do you consent to that's not right? And then get it into your being. No, I'm going to refuse to consent. <laughs> it reminds me of the story, you know, I think it's in one of the articles. Uh, about if you allow a traveler, bad traveler, to come inside and you give it a seat and you give it some tea and something to drink, now you want to want him to go out because he's the wrong person and it's very difficult. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> And, yeah, and there's a story, too, about the camel going into a tent. You know, he first puts his head in, pretty soon the old camel's in the tent, you can't get him out. So, so that's how it works. Here, and he calls his friends to come in. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. No, there has to be something within you. We were taught here, there has to be a sense of steel within you. Uh, you can be pleasant, nice, compassionate. But there's a there's a line that people do not cross. And if you don't have that line, you need to get it. You and it, it be a law. It reminds, yes. It reminded me of the story of, in the sorry. Go on. Go on. <laughs> it reminded me of the story in uh, the gospels with the the widow, the importuning widow who wanted something from the judge and knocked on his door and he wouldn't answer mm -hmm. and just kept knocking, knocking, knocking until the judge finally opened the door and gave her what she wants. Seems to me that when a scientist enters into a scene, um, that all of life kind of changes. And it seems like reality is very much in flux um, during those times. And when we as scientists can step forth and state our claims, you know, hold our hold our line, um, then it's almost as if reality shifts for us um, and kind of accommodates the kingdom coming in, the kingdom coming down into the earth. And it reminded me of, um, it used to be when we would send letters to people, we had that melting wax and then a little signet uh, ring or stick that you would press into the the still warm wax and it would make um, the signet mark. And it's like as if a, a scientist can come into life and make it her or his claim. And then this says, this earth is a claim for the kingdom. Um, and then all of the, everything just shifts at that point. I really love this watch. Well, what shifts is your concept of reality because when you stand for what is real reality becomes more apparent to you mm. and if you do it in front of others it'll become more apparent to others as well we don't change facts mm -hmm. we clear our vision i like well, no one can change. Change. go ahead florence well, I don't think anybody can change the fact, but also I feel this way that if the reality I'm holding to, it, it honors God. It's it's what shows me that I am at one God, perfect God, perfect man. And the suggestions that come are coming to like deny God's allness. Then I, you know, to that to me, it, it makes me feel more, um, adamant or more indignant in how dare you, you know, you're coming to say what, to deny God? No, you won't. Uh, from that point of view, I think. It, 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 Absolutely. That, that gives you all power. Thank you very much. That's it. That's the answer. 
Yes, it certainly is. You're just bringing into focus what's true and you have the power of God to do it because there's no other power. There's no other power. And it is what's true. You're bringing reality into focus. And as you do it, it helps others to see it as well. Now, in the lesson this week in the Bible, it says, and he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. I love that. And we used it in the Thursday night watch because, and that was handling this uh, satanic meeting going on in Boston next weekend, because this is always what we do. We, we um, destroy the face of the covering. It, it's a veil that's cast over the nations, that puts us to sleep, that makes us think the Adam dream is, is real and going on and we're battling it and it's something terrible. It's it's a veil. <laughs> and Mrs. Eddy calls it mesmerism, animal magnetism, hypnotism. And we have and we have a lesson on the subject. Ancient and modern necromancy, alias mesmerism and hypnotism. And what is the next word? Denounce. 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 Yeah. In other words, destroyed. And in this week's lesson, to break this earthly spell, get the true idea and divine principle of all that really exists and governs the universe harmoniously. Again, an earthly spell. A spell. This is always what it is. Don't make it more than what it is. Don't make it less than what it is. It has to be broken. Um, but it, it is this mesmerism, hypnotism. And we must, yes, denounce it and bring the facts, the facts of our being into focus and so into our experience. Who else was trying to speak? Well, I, I was just going to say that I liked what you said, Mary, a while back about um, how people, myself included, um, complain or you know, mention how quality of everything today is not like it used to be at any and and when you mentioned that i you know it's because and i i thought where did all this how did this all happen and it's because as a society we started to not care when quality started to go down we just sort of didn't think we deserved anything better or we didn't speak up and so now we're we're it just seems to be pervasive in, in everything, food, clothing, you name it. It's just the quality service, the quality of service. Everything has gone down because we've accepted it as, oh, it's no big deal or I don't care. Or, and now we're faced with, you know, this. And I, and I thought that was, that's a really good <clears throat> an example. If, if we don't stand up to error, it does seem to just, take over if we don't stand up to it and that's why I thank you very much but that's why mm -hmm. and, and again we saw that in mrs evans she would not tolerate things that weren't right and if you went to a restaurant the food wasn't good the service wasn't good maybe they had the music blaring we always talk about that we get up and tell them please turn the music down if they don't we don't come back again if if the food isn't right we do not come back again if they don't make it right we go somewhere else mm -hmm. You have to keep that standard or you go somewhere and the quality isn't good. You go somewhere else. The dry cleaners aren't doing what they should. If the people that work on your house aren't doing what they should, you should always get the best. And you should you should do that for yourself, too. Our whole standard, you see how sloppily people dress and look. Um, think of how they dressed in Mrs. Eddy's day. Oh, yeah. And now it, it and don't think, OK, well, this requires a lot of money. Not necessarily so. You could have one nice outfit or one nice piece of furniture in your home that'll last forever than getting just a bunch of junk. Um, these were these were Mrs. Evans was this was something hugely important to her. And she grew up in New York City. And there is a standard. You can get anything in New York, but you can also get the best. And she was used to a high standard. She used to talk about when she came home, you know, her mother 
I would have a home cooked delicious dinner by candlelight on a beautiful set table. And she, she continued um, that standard. She always went to the best markets to get the food. Again, you don't have to get a lot, but what you get should be the best. Certainly if you had company, it was a high standard. You take the cheese, next to the pie, <laughs> next to your life. She kept that standard and she enforced that in us. And it was, I mean, I didn't realize how important and great it was um, until maybe even later, but I, I certainly do now. So wherever you are, keep your standard and know you can. And again, it doesn't require a lot of money. You just be selective and careful. Craig, did you want to speak? I you know you re reference Mrs. Evans told the story of Mary Baker Eddy and the pie and the cheese. And, well, we read that before you oh, came. <laughs> I'm leaving wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was in the watching point. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. And, and more importantly, it's it's a life saving. You know, that's what this watch brings out. This is saving our lives when we do this. It is. Yeah. It mm -hmm. is. Remember, you're the image and likeness of God. Start your day out with that. And, and, you know, you should look the best you can, eat the best you can. Your home should be neat and orderly um, and as beautiful as it can be. Again, it doesn't necessarily take a lot of money because people will use that as an excuse or, or think they want something someone else has. Make your own place beautiful. And maybe that will lead into Linda's what Linda sent to me this week. Yes, I uh, was looking at the line specifically in the responsive <laughs> reading where it said, "If how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And I looked that up in a commentary. And, uh, and there's also a line, uh, the first line that says, lest at any time we should let them slip. And we are constantly instructed here to keep our oil and, and not to let things slip. But when I read this commentary from Matthew Henry, he said, uh, quote, sinning against the gospel is neglect of this great salvation. It is contempt of the saving grace of God in Christ, making light of it, not caring for it, not regarding the worth of the gospel of grace or the want of it, and our undone state without it. Here is an appeal to the conscience of sinners. <clears throat> Even partial neglects will not escape rebukes. They often bring darkness on the souls they do not finally ruin, end quote. And that really hit home to me how such a lack of love it is not to, when you neglect. But uh, I went to Mrs. Eddy's definition of salvation, too. And that's and then you're ne neglecting what she said, quote, salvation, life, truth and love understood and demonstrated as supreme over all sin, sickness and death destroyed. End quote. <clears throat> so it gave me a new sense of how important it was to keep the lamp burning. It was not just. It was a deeper to me that it's, it's, it's the whole salvation for everybody. I mean, because you're bringing the light to the world. Uh, but in this process, they came across a interesting story. The um, woman was talking about how important it was that we each have a bean patch. And she calls that a sphere of influence that no one else has. And that by our steadfast prayers, we can bless it. And, and by our spiritual warfare, we can defend it. And then she gave this story, which I had never heard of, of a, um, somebody in the Bible uh, around the time of Goliath, uh, in Samuel 2:23, and it says, quote, "The Philistines were gathered into a troop where there was a plot of ground full of lentils, and the Israelites fled from the Philistines. But Shema took his stand in the midst of the plot, defended it, and struck the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory." End quote. And I thought that was very inspiring. Um, that you take care of your own beet patch. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it, you, it was also the ter yeah the term 
Bean Patch comes from an example of persistence and bravery demonstrated by one of David's mighty men, Shema, whose name means God is there. He partnered with God, defending his garden, and the Lord brought a victory. And then that story in, in 2 Samuel. But again, this is the moral courage to stand up, right? Not to just back off um, and let things happen any which way. Uh, you've got to stand. If you don't stand for something, you will fall, fall for anything. anything. Yeah. Fall for anything. So stand, stick with your rights. A lot of things go on because they're not challenged. They're totally wrong. E even in our government, they have no basis. They have no, there's no back. There's no laws to support some of the things that go on. And yet we take it because we think we don't, we, we have to. We don't have to. And we try to run and hide and go into special neighborhoods or special yeah, schools. Yeah, yeah, we try to move. Spreading. <laughs> we try to move out of the area thinking, oh, someplace else will be better. Well, that someplace else, it you, follows you right along because yeah. it's in your consciousness. You must take the stand always. And for others, too. Not for just for uh, absolutely. For others. Namely for others as well at you, as, as yourself, but for yes. And those who did anything great in history are those who did take the stand. I think people around the world, everyone is waking up to the fact that they don't have to take certain things. And that's good. With God, all things are possible. All good things are possible. So, Thank you. Yes. Right. We all have to get to that point, either here or hereafter, don't we? Yes. Yeah. Well, that's and that's the love of God that teaches us um, what's right, um, reminds us when we transgress or disobey. And if we uh, and if we, we will take the correction when we do transgress or disobey, if we will take the recompense of reward in its right sense and not get upset about it. We will learn the lesson, won't we? Yeah, it's the only time you learn the lesson. Exactly. Which requires humility. That's why. I like this. What? Oh, go ahead. That's why, why. Why pride is not your friend. It doesn't help you get where you need to get to for your own good. Go ahead. Um, I really like this watch that we've been talking about because it's so important that we learn that the handling those little things um, is really important because when they're little, they're a lot easier to handle. And by handling the little things, we learn to handle bigger things as they come up. And it's kind of like that article about, oh, stupid gardener. <laughs> if you don't weed the garden when it's little, it turns into big, horrible stuff. And I just really like this watch. Thank you. Yeah. And it, it goes along with probation after death because, um, I mean, we're counseled. It, it's, it's in living that's important, right? It's how you live now, living the best life, keeping this standard, not letting things slip. And if you do that, then you'll be better prepared <laughs> for the next the stage, <laughs> if you will. And and overcoming this, this belief of death. What does the golden text call it? The last enemy. The last enemy. You're handling all these other ones beforehand. So you know, you're you realize it's it's it is a big nothing. It tries to say it's something, but it's it's a big nothing. Um and you do it. Day by day, you take your stand, you keep your standard high, you don't run from problems, you face them. I thought this was beautiful, too. This uh, It's in the lesson in the Bible about, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Now, in this beautiful article by Tomlinson, Irving Tomlinson, the name of it giving itself the life giving voice. This is so important. Listen to what he says. He says the vital message given in the fifth chapter of John 
the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live, is a prophecy which proved true when the dead did hear and heed the voice of Jesus. The widow's son and Lazarus caught the master's words and arose from the dream of death to life and activity. Those dead in trespasses and sin were awakened. Um, And then the needful condition for the restoration of those who are deadened to health and peace is simply that the voice of truth be heard and assimilated. St. Augustine thus beautifully phrases it, Thou dost give audience everywhere, O truth, to all who ask counsel of thee, and at once answerest. Though on manifold matters they ask thy counsel, clearly dost thou answer, though all do not hear. The action of truth upon the awakened is like the rising of a curtain to let in the sunshine. When the darkness necessarily vanishes, so from the open ear and receptive heart of the needy comes a stimulating and corrective voice of truth. And the work of banishing the darkness of error is silently but surely accomplished. The psalmist says, he spake and it was done. That is to say, the spiritual universe, including man, is the speech, the word of divine mind, eternal truth, the one omnipotent God. Because the utterance of the Father is clear, distinct, and powerful, so the voice of the true man is spiritual, truthful, and loving. When a son of God so speaks, those apparently dead to truth hear his voice and live. It is so beautiful to think, you know, that is what's needed to hear that voice. It will raise the dead. And they're all kinds of dead, right? Mostly dead asleep, dead to the world. Yeah. And and then it goes on to say, you know, what's needed to give that voice of truth and also the voice of truth in the Bible, the voice of truth in science and health. Isn't that the voice of truth speaking? And it will raise the what's dead in you if you allow it. Sometimes you don't even know what's dead. Seems uh, key is when any individual wakes to the responsibility that God's given them, they are more receptive to wake up to all of his directions, you know, from the dead. They yes. Sleep around this world thinking they have nothing or no responsibility. Or <clears throat> then there's, uh, it's, it's harder to move them to, you know, inspire them to go forth and, and, and do good. Thank you. So just make sure what, after taking in this truth, being Rouse and awaken yourself that you give it to others as well to arouse and awaken them. It's needed, so needed, as Craig just said. And then I loved in Signs and Health, life is, always has been, and ever will be independent of matter. For life is God, and man is the idea of God, not for materially, but spiritually, and not subject to decay and dust. This is why you start your day with God is life. God is my life. God is the only pure and perfect life. Your life is not dependent on your organs. Your sight is not dependent on your eyeballs. Your hearing is not dependent on your ears. Your movement is not dependent on your joints. It's dependent on God. And you should be talking to yourself like this all day long. You lean on God. Man is not material. You are not material. You are spiritual. As the image and likeness of God. Get rid of this idea that you've got to check all your vitals, okay, to find out if you're alive or not. (laughs) I think in the in the the mind of Christ, which Paul talks about, we all should, you know, always claim the my mind is a divine mind because that's the only mind that cannot be mesmerized. And so if we stay in this mind continually, day in, day out, as you say, then, you know, we are heading towards where the mesmerism cannot, you know, walk all over us. Thank you. Thank you. And you can never, uh, you can never lose 
anything when you do that. You can never miss anything good when you do that. You can't, you, you're not going to, you're not going to miss anything. I mean, you know, the world will tell you you're going to miss out on all kinds of interesting stuff. Well, that's a, it's a bald lie. You're not going to miss out on anything. And the reason is that divine mind is everything. So it's the only way to have everything good in your life. Yeah. And, and you know, we talk, taught here and go over it. This is a carnal mind. The carnal mind is, is a killer. And we've read about what that is. I think it's in Ephesians or Galatians or, you know, lust and jealousy and a whole list of things. So when you indulge in those things, you're quietly killing yourself. You're you're dead. <laughs> you're um, that's why an army of conspirators. Is yeah, an army of conspirators you, yeah. against you. Mm-hmm. Yep, because absolutely. It would make you numb. You to to <clears throat> it would just make you numb to God and to good and to love, I guess, unselfishness. Yes, thank you. <laughs> that's why I, you know I love that hymn. Rouse ye, rouse ye, face the foe. Rouse yourself out of those. You find yourself. Getting into that state of thought, don't. And this is what Florence was saying. You stay in the divine mind. You live there with with all the fruit fruit of the spirit, all the divine thoughts, the thoughts from God. And that's that's what keeps you happy, healthy, alive, working, meeting problems with joy. The victor, always the victor, never the vanquished. So, what did you write about Chardell that you sent to oh, me? Oh well, it's everything you're talking about now. Now it's it's uh, Science and Health 39. Now, cry the apostle is the accepted time. So you know, go and do it. <laughs> and, and, and I, I love it. Uh, now is the time for so-called material pains and material pleasures to pass away. For both are unreal <clears throat> because impossible in science. And uh, it's a beautiful thing to work with. I used to wait and wait. And then this is so beautiful. Yeah, right. Today, don't put it off. Right now, right now you can overcome so much. And what a privilege it is. And, and we that's why we have problems to work through these things, to prove. God's presence and power is all that's real. So, and Nancy, what did you send to me? And not reading the whole thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I was just focusing on um, the last uh, citation in Science and Health, establishing the true temple or body whose builder and maker is God. And uh, just I found an article uh, about building the temple where it states how Mrs. Eddy has given us the true meaning of the science of being with which we can break every law of uh, the so-called carnal commandments. And that's how we obtain the power of endless life. Uh, She taught us to have one mind and to love one another and said, thus, we may establish in truth the temple or body whose builder or maker is God. Uh, Man never dies, but material sense or the belief in matter must perish in order to prove man is deathless. I just thought that was very good. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes. And and as we do this, as as we live these things, we are overcoming this belief of death. And always remember the refusal to consent to it the refusal we're not going to bow down to anything that's not of god and there's a beautiful story um it's in many places but it's in the adam dickey memoirs of mary baker eddie mrs eddie raising calvin fry right um i think he passed on more than once yes. and and yeah it went on you know it went on for a while her students couldn't arouse him and how, how did she rouse him? What what did she tell him? You have work to do. Thank you. You have work to do. Yes. She didn't handle heart disease. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
She said, you've got work to do. Animal magnetism cannot take you away from me. And when he first woke up from this, he did say, I want to go. I want to go. And she said, see, there it is. There's the suggestion. There's the argument. You're tired. You want to go. You watch those suggestions and arguments. So she did. She And, you know, she absolutely proved the unreality. Go ahead. One, one of the times that he passed on, somebody said to him, where were you? He said, I was getting a piece of pie. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, and, you know, in other words, he was still, life goes on because <laughs> he's not dead. Absolutely. So anyway, there's another beautiful article that also Carrie sent to me from by William McCracken. We should put it in a in a liberator. I can't get into the whole thing now, but it brings out um, how we're brethren. Um, we're all brethren. And we need to feel that and, and work that way and not to see people as anything but that. Um, this was something beautiful. This again from another article. Um, it was called Despite the Seeming. Um, in Science and Health, Mrs. Eddy says the furnace separates the gold from the dross that the precious metal may be graven with the image of God. And then the fiery baptism will burn up the chaff from the era. No one has ever gone so low in the moral scale, but there is a reflection of divine omnipresent love to be found hidden somewhere in the seeming worthlessness. Can we then afford to condemn anyone who may turn to us for love and assistance and say there is no good in him? I just, that's so beautiful. You never know. <laughs> you know, you never know. Uh, despite the seeming, there's something good in everyone. There would have to be because we're all the image and likeness of God. So no matter what era seems to have done to a person to make him seem like there's nothing really of good there, he's our brother. And despite the seeming, there's a child of God and we must look for it and bring it out. That's our work. That's our, I, I, that's why we handle RC because it puts people down. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. They don't know who they are. They think they're, thank you, Craig. They think, you know, you're born a sinner. You're going to die a sinner, all that kind of thing. No, every single one is a child of God. I don't care how bad things can seem to be in. There's a child of God. Despite the seeming. Mm -hmm. Doing that, you have seen God everywhere. Thank so. you. Yes. yes. So I would, I would like to thank everyone for the very powerful treatments that have been given during this morning's roundtable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> it's good to have you here. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I love to be with everyone in our church family. <laughs> that we are a family. We are. You know, I get I get emails and things saying that that's kind of what attracts them to us and to this round table. We sound like a family and we're having so much fun. <laughs> so I'm very grateful for that. I'm glad I it would be terrible if we didn't sound like a family and we weren't having so much fun. <laughs> anyway, we're going to end now. This is chapter 69 in footsteps. And I feel it's about handling malpractice, what malpractice is. And I feel it goes with citation 12 in the lesson. When false human beliefs learn even a little of their own falsity, they begin to disappear. A knowledge of error and of its operations must precede that understanding of truth, which destroys error until the entire mortal material error finally disappears and the eternal verity, man created by and of spirit, is understood and recognized as the true likeness of his maker. So this is chapter 69 in Her Spiritual Footsteps by Gilbert Carpenter. The Bible indicates that the master was the way shower. Mrs. Eddy's mission was to show and prove that Jesus' way was not only practical and scientific, but the only way. In so doing, she had to experiment and to test every step. 
consider the injustice of calling any such tests mistakes, when they were all part of the necessary development of her spiritual discernment. There are those who have claimed that she made a mistake when she wrote the chapter Demonology in the third edition of her textbook, Science and Health, in which she depicted animal magnetism as a, quote, lurking demonology in our very midst, end quote. Yet she was but recording error as it confronted her, as she walked the path God laid out for her, and doing so faithfully. We learned from Mrs. Eddy's history that the claim of animal magnetism first appeared to her as a blinding flash, as a power wielded by the enemy that, no matter how modest or set apart one might be, always stood ready to swallow the offspring of the woman, the spiritual development of her thought. Then, as her faith in God and her allness and the allness of his power became more and more real to her, she lost enough of her fear of this blinding flash to face it and dissect it, to learn of what it was composed. Hearing a mighty roar of evil, she began to trace it back to its origin, and instead of finding a mighty lion, she discovered a diminutive mouse squeaking through a megaphone. Thus, she commenced to learn something of the illusion called animal magnetism. In her later experiences, she never lost sight of the claim that is never recognized by the easygoing, placid human thought. When she analyzed the claim, however, by picking it to pieces, she discovered it to be an illusion, nothing claiming to be something, a bluff that is all front and no back. On the other hand, if it is unrecognized, it is the one great deterrent to man's spiritual growth. First, the student must deal with malpractice and overcome any fear of it through analyzing it. Then it can be dealt with scientifically. Good counsel. Good counsel. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. 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 Thank you.